Um, I hope you aren't disappointed. Um, but thank you, Jeff, for teeing me up like that. Um, but I, I was uh, talking on the radio today and uh, doing a joint interview with, um, they had patched in uh, an American veteran from New York, a fellow named Scott Bo Beauchamp. And, um, and the uh, presenter was asking him what, asking Scott what he thought of my book. And, and this young veteran said, well, um, I, I approached it with a lot of skepticism. I mean, he had never been in the military, and so I was expecting all kinds of um, mistakes, large and small. And, um, and actually, you know, I didn't find any of those and, and felt like it was, you know, solid on all counts, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But he's too old. <laughs> he felt like I was too old to, to write a novel like this, and I don't know, maybe he's right. Um, good thing I didn't have to ask permission of anybody. Um, but, uh, you know, it is a valid point. I've never served in the military, and I've never experienced combat as such. Um, I've spent quite a bit of time in Haiti, and so I have some experience with situations of violence and fear and, and confusion, but I've never been in a, a shooting war. And so, um, and I'm, I'm also using notes. Um, I'm the only one who has handwritten his notes. So you can infer from that what you will uh, about the American public school system. But, um, but, you know, I think, you know, going into the writing of this book, um, I was consciously debating whether I had the right to undertake a book like this. Um, and even before you get to issues of credibility and authenticity, I think there's a real moral issue here. Um, I mean, there's an aspect of hubris and arrogance that applies to a significantly greater extent when you're talking about war as opposed to other forms of writerly appropriation. And by that I mean men writing from the point of view of women, women writing from the point of view of men, or humans writing from the point of view of animals or aliens or inanimate objects. Um, and you could probably lump historical fiction into this, um, science fiction, uh, alternative history, um, and speculative future fiction. You could probably lump all of those into this um, universe of perhaps doomed, phys excuse me, fictional subjects. Um, in the abstract, it, it all seems like pure insanity, actually, to try to write about anything that's not your own experience. And maybe anybody who does presume to do this should have their head examined. Um, but when it's actually done, and done well, um, it seems like one of the sanest and most naturally human things there is. This telling of stories across the boundaries of time and space and personality. And usually I think it's better for a writer and certainly better in my case if you just go ahead and presume uh, to write a book like this, to plunge in and work with you know, mani maniacal desperation and go on faith that maybe at some point, you will have, by virtue of doing it correctly and diligently, you will have earned the right to write a book like this. Um, I say usually it's better to plunge in, but war is a different animal altogether, and I think it's here that one feels most acutely this sense of infringing on territory that doesn't belong to you and that properly belongs only to those who've experienced it firsthand. And maybe that's as it should be, this hesitation um, approaching this kind of thing with, with um, I mean, a certain amount of reverence, actually. Um, I think any time you're dealing with matters of blood, of literal life and death, that you're obligated to approach it with a great deal of caution. And it seems to me the only humanly decent way to do it is to do it with full awareness um, and to as part of this awareness to ask yourself um, bluntly if there's any kind of realistic chance that you might discover something authentic and useful, something that might serve to illuminate this aspect of human experience. Otherwise, it's better just to leave it alone. You can't ever really answer a question like that prospectively, but you can have a sense that's stronger or weaker, more compelling or less, and hopefully without getting too dramatic or precious about it, I think maybe it boils down to a sense of whether you have to write this particular story. Can you have any peace in yourself if you don't make the attempt? 
Um, in some fundamental sense, it has to rise to the level of necessity. And maybe that's as it should be anyway in all writing. Maybe no writer ever wrote anything worth a damn unless he or she had to write that book. Well, obviously, I did go forward, and I wrote this book, Billy Lynn's Long Halftime Walk. And I presumed for better or worse um, to write about the war, this war that I'd never witnessed. Um, but I felt like with that presumption, that act of presumption, came the strict obligation to do the work that might make it possible, if only barely, that I might do this with some degree of success. And I'm talking now about work that goes by the name of research, where you read all the books, you collect and read all the magazine articles, you watch all the documentaries, and you talk to all the people who are willing to talk to you. And if they aren't willing to talk, you make a nuisance of yourself until they finally agree. Um, my basic approach to these things, to research, is immersion, just to um, dive in head first and try to learn everything I can. And I feel like it's a necessary part of the process. It's not the only thing that's required, and it may not even be the main thing that's required. And I think, in fact, the deeper you go into the research, the greater the risk you run of killing the project altogether. And by that, I mean of burying the human core of the story underneath the sheer mass of knowledge you've accumulated, all the facts and analyses and observations and attitudes that have become more or less settled wisdom about the war. So I think the challenge is to absorb all the research and then, in a sense, to forget it, and forget it in the hope of remaining susceptible to all the confusion and uncertainty and ambiguity of the actual experience. In other words, to account for the messy provisionality of the lived experience. And Jeff Dyer discusses this at some length in his very fine book, The Missing of the Somme. And he variously describes it as the problem of overdetermination or historical back projection, those instances where the novelist, or even in some cases the memoirist with firsthand experience, leans all too comfortably on the linguistic and thematic conventions established by previous writing about the war. So in the end, the cliches become more powerful than the original experience, and the writer becomes too comfortable in his writing and the reader too comfortable in his reading to allow for the possibility that anything vital or real might be discovered. I didn't read Jeff's book until this past week, but I think this was the problem I was sensing and trying to grapple with while I was writing Billy Lynn. But in any case, this issue of overdetermination felt very familiar to me when I was reading Jeff's book. And without strictly meaning to, I started trying to reconstruct my frame of mind while I was writing Billy Lynn. And I think my sense of the problem was this. If I was going to succeed to any degree in writing this book about war, it would happen by developing an, idi an idiom that would account for the uncertainty and confusion of the present moment, or in other words, for the contingency of the lived experience. It had to happen or begin to happen at the level of the sentence by twisting and stressing and torquing the American language in such a way that it might capture the complexity of the soldier's experience. Not just the, immediately, excuse me, not just the immediate sensory overload of their day at Texas Stadium, but all the ongoing layering of past and future, conscious and unconscious, motive and drift, and dread and desire. I took my cue from the language attitude of the soldiers themselves that extraordinarily rich and malleable language that they invent and reinvent in the course of dealing with an endless series of impossible situations. It's a language that's seething with irony and knowingness and insider code, but there's more to it than that. What struck me most about the way the soldiers talked was their infinite resourcefulness. It's a kind of genius for lyrical obscenity whereby a phrase as common and exasperated as, oh, for the love of God, gets transformed into, oh, for the fuck of shit. <laughs> what soldiers deal with and what I was trying to portray are situations so extreme and freighted that obscenity becomes an expression of essential human decency. Words don't fail us. They can't be allowed to fail us, not if we mean to hang on to our humanity. 
So whatever discoveries I made in the writing of this book started from there. Thank you very much. Thank you.